fun. So, um, next speaker is an uh, old friend of Giga Science, uh, author of a couple of papers, second time at uh, ICG, four papers, uh, second time on ICG, um, Thomas Alexic. Um, <coughs> so, it's people that we've been power up as a bit of a kind of emblem and sort of pet project of ours. Um, uh, Thomas is an uh, alumni of Steve O'Brien's lab and is there for since 2009. <coughs> been in the um, University of Puerto Rico's MagWeb, um, working on, on a lot of work on parrots, but this is actually uh, a different species, and I'll let Taras say more. Thank you very much. Is that, is that a duty? <laughs> uh, first, I want to start with thanking uh, PGI for inviting me here, especially the Giga Science team, with great friends, and um, amazing uh, opportunity to be here. and. Uh, uh, and also, uh, I congratulate everybody who already won, so. <laughs> um, anyway, um, I came, as uh, Scott said, I'm uh, coming here from um, the Caribbean. And, so, where do I go? I come here from the islands uh, in the Caribbean, uh, specifically my university at the University uh, at the Puerto Rico, uh, and uh, my studies in the uh, uh, island of Hispaniola, uh, some other places, languages call it uh, Haiti. Uh, there are two countries here, uh, Dominican Republic and Haiti, and there's Cuba here, so you have a more general direction. Uh, maybe you've heard about us uh, lately uh, in the last uh, Months. We were in the past of Hurricane Maria um, that destroyed uh, most of the infrastructure there, including uh, uh, a lot of infrastructure in my department and lost a lot of samples. Um, so it's a pretty sad story. There are a lot of, I'm glad to be here again. Um, um, there are still people out there without power and electricity. And, and uh, um, uh, after this uh, conference, I'm going to go back and try to. We store everything. Uh, not the power, but just everything in my lab. Uh, I will talk about uh, the a very interesting animal today, uh, which is on island of Hispaniola. Uh, the name for it is uh, Solenodon, uh, the specific species, Solenodon paradoxus, from, uh, from the island of um, Hispaniola. There are two uh, species of Solenodons in the world. One lives on island of Hispaniola, another one lives on another Caribbean island of Cuba. Uh, this has uh, been thought as uh, one of the most ancient branches among the central mammals. Uh, an earlier paper uh, from Dr. Brian's lab has uh, put the virgin rate on this branch to uh, uh, approximately 76 million years ago, which was made uh, uh, the speciation uh, before the time of dinosaurs. Um, so here's the piece of uh, uh, tree from that paper. It was published in Nature. Uh, Al Roker was a very good friend of mine, who was the first author. Uh, uh, it places the separation of Solenodons from the Mammalian tree sometime when the Antilles separated from North America, which, is, which implies that this animal has survived on the islands for more than 70 million years, right? So that's an amazing fact in itself. Uh, so all our close ancestors are gone. Um, and it is, it's very unusual looking animal. Uh, and one of the most unusual thing about it is one of the few mammals, the eutherian mammals, that are reported to have venom. And its venom is, it's not clear what it really uses the weapon for, but they have teeth that have a specific groove in it that looks like a little tooth. And that's why it's called selenodon, because selenodon means groove tooth. Okay? It survived all the, since the time of the dinosaurs, but today they are critically endangered because humans broadcast them off. They're hunting. Um, in the uh, words of Dr. Roca, uh, basically Slamadon is a giant brand of Freddy Krueger claws. So <laughs> this. Um, uh, so 
questions that we were really interested in is what the 70 million years of splendid isolation of an island will do to a genome? I think that one big question in itself, very, very interesting question. We also look at the validations of earlier studies with genome-wide data. The earliest study was done on the fragments of mitochondrial DNA on a data that to 76 million years ago. And we published a paper on full mitochondrial DNA, which we supported it. But then another group looked at the Cuban selenodon, uh, pushed the data, uh, used the nuclear data, uh, five uh, nuclear genes, and pushed the data to less than 60 million years ago, which would imply the Sopranodons, in fact, swam across to the island. They didn't fall on that. So uh, that in itself is a controversy we would like to split. And then finally, we uh, saw morphometric data coming out and suggesting that Sopranodons are, in Hispaniola, maybe two different su uh, subspecies. Now, if they are different subspecies, then in fact just preserving one part of this area is not enough. Uh, they might be consisting of uh, considering several uh, conservation units, so it was very important to split. Okay, so um, what we decided to do is to go out there and make an expedition, go to Española and try to uh, find some of these uh, enigmatic animals, uh, get, some, uh, get some DNA out of them and sequence their genomes. So we put together an expedition. Uh, here's uh, Dr. Martinez Pusano, he's a very good friend of mine, a great Puerto Rican scientist, and has been uh, a friend uh, and, uh, uh, um, and a partner in uh, many things in uh, Puerto Rico. Uh, it's me. Uh, here's uh, Ariel Nunez, who is uh, working uh, in a veteran area at Zudon, which is the National Zoo of the Dominican Republic. Uh, we also brought, uh, uh, also brought uh, students, uh, various students, both from Puerto Rico, Yashira, and uh, from uh, Dominican Republic, uh, Luis Paulino. Uh, we all went out there onto uh, uh, Central Dominican uh, Republic. Uh, before that, we spent lots of time applying to uh, get permits, and, uh, from both from Dominican Republic, from the United States, from the Fish and Wildlife Service, and from the uh, It actually took a lot more time than the expedition itself. Um, uh, and uh, last but not least, uh, there is these uh, amazing people that we uh, uh, hired uh, uh, in uh, local guides who uh, knew uh, uh, the habits of this animal and have participated in uh, conservation efforts for these animals. This is uh, uh, Nicolas and Nicolas Corona. He is Nicolas Corona, the father, uh, who is uh, one of the people that really understand how, how swimming dogs live. We learned a lot about swimming dogs from him. Um, and uh, he taught us how to find and how to catch the animal. And basically the idea is that you go out in the jungle and, uh, during the day and you study the uh, leaf litter and you will be able to find feces and the little trails that these animals do during the day, uh, during the night. Um, and then you come back, you have a little, little bit of uh, dinner and you go back to the morning uh, in complete darkness and sit next to one of those trails. You might be sitting in the darkness for hours uh, listening to selenodons walking around. And, and this animal is, uh, uh, it, it doesn't see very well, but it has a very good sense of smell. Uh, as you can see that that little long uh, snap that we have. And uh, we have a lot of this bristle, so it goes around and, and sh uh, goes through the leaves. And you can hear it. And then when it, you think it got close enough to you, then you turn out the headlamp and you start running after it. And it's, uh, it doesn't run very fast, which is good for us. And you grab it by the tail. And, you know, this is just like a rat. You grab, grab it by the tail. And it's the safest way to catch it because you don't want to run, grab it by the, by the venomous teeth, obviously. Um, so we, uh, uh, this is what I explained one time to a journalist, but this is not what came out. <laughs> um, so this is a this is a story that, that came out in the, in the, actually was retweeted by a lot of people from Reddit that Dr. Lex and his team left it simple by laying on the ground waiting for them to crawl across the body. So um, yeah, I actually you see this, this is Kevin of Love. I was afraid of this so much. Um, we uh, trapped them. Uh, we called the public here in the southern part. This is the. Uh, what we supposedly a sub southern subspecies, and we also got uh, uh, animals from the zoo from the, the northern part. Okay. Um, 
And then uh, by the time we got these samples across to the United States and send it uh, to a company for sequencing, they in fact uh, said that all the northern sample samples, except for one, were not uh, good for sequencing. Uh, we did sequence uh, genome, uh, uh, for genomes from the from the southern swan dance, uh, but then when the data came in, I was very very disappointed because, as you can see, many of you understand what this is, right? This is the KMERS stacked up, and you say that the the KMERS um, density is the highest at five, which means the average coverage of the genome is five x. Of course, nobody can do a short read genome assembly with 5x genomes. Not that I... But this is my graduate student's master's thesis, and we have to do something, right? And so we're sitting there all, uh, all uh, you know, kind of bewildered with this and thinking, what are we going to do? What are we going to do with this data? And uh, at some point we have this, let's try this. Let's take all these five individuals better now and put them together and th this is this is a very very strange thing to do why would you mix genomes of five different animals up into one pool well remember this animal has survived on an island for a very very long time but what happens one of the predictions that will happen it, it, it actually lose a lot of genetic diversity. So our working hypothesis is that these genomes are very, very high, highly homozygous. And so if we mix them together, then what would this curve look like if we mix them together? Well, 5 times 5x five is 25, right? 5 times 25, it's, it's about 25. So we see that peak where they all lay on top of each other. So the average coverage, if we combine the data, is 25. Now, OK, uh, where would be the differences between these genomes? Where would they pile up? Well, they will pile up where one is different than everybody else. So their, their coverage would be 5, right? This one individual is 5. So there should be a peak here indicating that there are differences of one individual against everybody else, right? And I don't see a few. So therefore, the best explanation of that, these, these genomes are highly homozygous. They're very, very much alike each other. And in fact, we could probably try to mix them together and assemble a genome. We could do assemble a genome with X25. Now that is still kind of low. So we thought, okay, so how do we assemble? What's the best approach to that? And we tried to, and we, we said, okay, we'll try all of the possible things. And all of the possible things right now is uh, the Bruton-based assembly, like we spoke in two, which is a standard approach, and it's based on basically picking out the perfect alignments between cameras, which is short, uh, um, short fragments of the same size and sort of reducing data to the point where it's easy to assemble things. Okay? And if you don't have you know, very long uh, contents out of that, you just add more data. This is what the strategy has been. Make it 100x, make it 200x, make it 300x. And you know, well, sometimes you will find all these came with the overlap. Now there's a new kind of a reinvention of an old thing. Uh, which is called a string graph assembly. In fact, it's based on the same kind of thinking that the first human genome assembly was done. And it says, well, let's not break things up in gamers. Instead, let's align the whole, all the lengths of the reads, and then find this longest string, and, and only after that, discard this, this fragments that didn't fit. In the way, it sort of uses data with, with the longer, uh, or the full length of data. Okay, so which one, in fact, was for that? And then that's what was our uh, analysis about. So we set up a, a four-way comparison. We had a combination of um, a stringer assembler called Fermi and the De Bruyne assembler called Soap De Nova 2. And if you look at something that the first thing people look at is the contact length, uh, you'll see that 
The strip graph assembly outperformed uh, the root assembly by a factor of 12, which was very shocking for us and strange for us. Too. We, we thought, okay, well, maybe, maybe it's uh, not finding the right thing. So we did, um, you know, uh, uh, Segment and, uh, and then Scott says, don't do Segment, do Busco because Segment is already updated. Okay, we did both. Um, and it, it kind of looks like we were finding, you know, the genes that we should be finding. All right, and then what we did went ahead, and then we split that into two more. So we had scaffolding with different tools. You know, so this one, the same. So we know two sets of space, so we know two sets of space, and so we know two. All right, so what we find in there is that, in fact, well, it, it turns out that you can't use as a space after subnode so 2 because subnode 2 actually introduces some things into the reads and then that corrects it later. So we could not do this part. But we did this one. And what happens is you can see that subnode so 2, the uh, Dubrun assembler, actually recompensates for, for some of the loss and it puts it into these long scaffolds. But these scaffolds contain a lot of uh, empty space as opposed to these. Okay? So they will have a small one and 50, but uh, their, their uh, contents are a small one. Okay, so this is good or, or bad. So what we wanted to know is, can our assembly actually contribute to understanding the species? So how did it contribute to understanding the species, the evolution, all these other things? Well, can we find genes in there that we can then later analyze, and everybody can analyze? So we train algorithms on the genes, uh, on other Corinthian mammals, that one of them, uh, and some other mammals, uh, that we knew had a good uh, uh, genome condition. And we made the hints out of that, and then we found those hints in this lambda genome, and then we uh, found them in, in the Corinthian database. And you can see that one of these assemblies, in fact, this is the uh, um, uh, Fermi with a space, finds uh, genes that are, are very long and uh, with 100% support. So uh, outperforms other ones. I actually didn't see the, show the C assembly here. This one, you see the scale? It's twice as tall here with, with these 100% uh, 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 support for it. So it identifies genes very well. So our assembly, not that just we scrambled our data, uh, sorry, we salvaged our data, but we actually come, came up with something useful that can be used later on. All right, um, and then we actually said, okay, well, how many mistakes in there are? And we used a, a program called Reaper, found that this assembly B, in fact, performs very well. It has a lot less low square regions of interacting with the reads. Um, and then we said, okay, how about this? This is the last experiment we did. How about this? If we compare all three assemblies to a known well-assembled genome, in this case it's a shrew, it's the closest thing we can find in Sonata. Then, by the parsimony principle, um, the best assembly should have the least number of, of, of differences, right? Because if, differences, if there, there are differences, more differences, they are more likely to be introduced by our assembly, but not by evolution itself. And then also, again, assembly B turns out to be more likely, uh, uh, more has less translocations and inversions compared to the Shri genome as that do the other assemblies, which means that we're more likely introducing mistakes into our assembly. Okay, so the outcome of that, you know, this is a, uh, this is our, our uh, 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 other things. So, so this is the conclusion of the outcomes, and uh, then Scott tricked me into submitting this into this competition. And so, and then we, we uh, hopefully going to have it published. But what about the original question? We did use the genome data to validate our original conclusion. Yes, this species has split from uh, the Ethereum tree 74 million years ago. Second, it's Shown to be one of the most homozygous animals. No, I will scale that. They're not as homozygous as cheetah, which is what Dr. Brian showed is the most homozygous thing ever. But remember, Solenodon, these are five individuals together. So there's some residual 
that was asked of heterozygosity Zygotsky from the other individual. So we finally get a very good estimate of the genome uh, of the one individual. This number will probably go low. Finally, are there two subspecies? And the answer is there have been two subspecies with different demographic histories that existed for at least the last 300,000 years. So yes, we should conserve these separately. And then when you start doing stuff like this, uh, people will know about it and they come and help you. And this is what happened in the last G10K meeting when uh, uh, Harris Lewin from UC Davis says, oh, you have this uh, genome? Well, we can, we can use this to make Chicago libraries. And we came from our uh, uh, current assembly with uh, 5,500 uh, scaffolds to uh, scaffolds that have chromosomal level data. Woo! Right. <laughs> All right. So, why stop there? Let's go and uh, go to the next island and get the other solenodon, and we'll have the whole genus, the first genus, completely sequenced, although at a high quality genome. Although there's only two species, so it's kind of easy. Um, so that's where we're going to go next, and I hope to talk to you about that project next time I'm here. I would like to thank this very important person. This is the student who did the analysis. And he probably shouldn't be here talking about this, but he got accepted to Cornell, so, you know, uh, because of this. So it's good for him. <laughs> this is our team from here is the Puerto Rico. This is uh, uh, the team from Dr. Brian over from uh, Lubchansky Center. Amazing, amazing uh, uh, guys. And they taught my students a lot as well. A team from the Dominican Republic. A team from uh, Portugal that did the Venom Genome location and finally the original guys that uh, had the idea about Solidodon's Dr. Volta and thank you very much. <laughs>